Okay, so let's be honest for a sec. You probably brought Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics to this deep dive because it's one of those books, right? The ones you feel like you should read. It's a classic. We all know that. But um, And long. Yeah. It's really interesting, though, how many people want to read these huge books. You all obviously want to learn how to live a really fulfilling life. Yeah, totally. But how much can advice written that long ago really apply to us today? I mean... That's the question. And to make it even more interesting, we're going to talk about Aristotle himself, too. Did you know he wasn't just a philosopher? Really? Yeah. This guy was a total science nerd. Wow. Okay, I have to admit, I don't know that much about Aristotle. Okay, well, get ready. It's 384 BCE in ancient Greece, and Aristotle is around doing his thing. This is not some philosopher hanging out under a tree thinking about life. We're talking about someone who wanted to understand it all. Biology, government, logic, everything. He even studied sea creatures. He was like the first Renaissance man way before the Renaissance. Exactly. And I think you'll notice that this huge curiosity he had is at the root of his whole philosophy on how to have a good life. So we've got Aristotle the philosopher, Aristotle the scientist. Let's get to the good stuff. When he talks about living well, he's really talking about happiness. He is, but not happiness how we think about it. Mm -hmm. Today, we think about happiness as just those good vibes. Aristotle had another word for it that meant way more, eudaimonia. It means something mm -hmm. more like flourishing. Yeah. Think about it as like a state of being, a way of living that is fulfilling and meaningful. And it's not just about looking for those little bursts of pleasure. So it's less about getting those highs and more about like building a life that's actually fulfilling on a deeper level. Yes. And this is where it gets really cool. Aristotle thought that even slaves and animals could feel moments of pleasure. But eudaimonia, this deeper happiness that was totally human, it comes from using our brains, our ability to make decisions that create a good life. And that's where the whole virtue thing comes in, right? I'll be honest, when I hear virtue, I think about rules, which honestly doesn't sound like fun. Yeah. That's what people think. Aristotle didn't think about virtue as some strict list of rules. It's more about becoming a better person as time goes on. He thought about it like a skill you practice like archery. Okay, so less about all the don'ts and more about developing those inner qualities that make you a better person. But what's the goal? What are we actually aiming for? In Aristotle's view, it's about finding the golden mean. But that doesn't mean being boring or average. It means you understand that being good usually means finding that balance between two extremes. And this isn't just our actions, but also how we feel. Can you give me an example? Like, how do you find the golden mean when it comes to, like, courage? Good question. Let's say you see someone is in trouble. The reckless thing to do, the extreme, would be to just run in without thinking. But being so scared that you do nothing. That's the other extreme. Being a coward. Aristotle thought real courage is finding that middle ground. It's about thinking clearly about what's going on and then doing something while being level-headed. So it's about being thoughtful and able to change, not just doing what you think you're supposed to do without thinking. Right. And this is where it gets really interesting. Aristotle didn't think the mind and body were separate like we do a lot of the time. He thought what he called the soul or the psyche is in all living things, hmm. plants, animals, people. We've all got souls, just at different levels. Hold on, so you're saying my houseplant has a soul? Kind of. Mm -hmm. It has what he'd call a vegetative soul, the ability to grow. Animals have what he called a sensitive soul. They can feel the world around them and react to it. And humans, we have a rational soul that lets us use logic, think, all that stuff that makes us well. It's... So there's levels to our souls. I'm guessing people are at the top. Of course. But here's something to think about. Aristotle thought there might be a part of the human mind that isn't connected to the body, something that might even mean we're immortal. Mm -hmm. It's an idea he didn't fully explain, but it just shows you how far his thinking went. A soul hierarchy and maybe we're immortal. <laughs> <laughs> Classic Aristotle. But uh, let's talk about something a little less intense for a sec, like pleasure. Did Aristotle think we should all just be robots? <laughs> like perfectly rational with no fun allowed? Not even. He knew that pleasure was natural important even. But, and you'll like this, he didn't think all pleasures were the same. So is there a pleasure hierarchy too? Getting a theme here with Aristotle. Yep. There are the basic pleasures. 
the lower ones. Things like having some amazing food or, okay, let's be real, endlessly scrolling on your phone. They feel good in the moment, but then they're gone. And then you have the intellectual pleasures. Those are higher. Like when you learn something new right. or really connect with someone or make something beautiful, those stick with you and they help you grow as a person. So it's like you're trying to match what you enjoy with those higher level things, finding joy in the things that make you a better person. Yeah. Aristotle thought that real happiness, that lasting eudaimonia comes when we do things that are good for ourselves and for other people. That makes sense. But honestly, it feels like our world now is designed to tempt us with those lower pleasures all the time. Everywhere you look, it's like instant gratification, quick fixes, so many distractions. It's true. Our world is completely different from Aristotle's. Yeah. But I think what he was talking about is actually more important now than ever. In a world that's always on and wants everything now, his focus on being a good person, finding balance, finding real meaning in what we do, it's not just some philosophical idea. It's like a guidebook for how to handle all the chaos. So if we understand these old ideas, these values he was talking about, we're actually more ready to deal with all the crazy stuff in the world today? Exactly. It's like having this ancient wisdom whispering to you. It's telling you to mm -hmm. stop, think, make choices that match your values. Even when there's like a million other things trying to get your attention. It's about finding that balance, that golden mean in a world that feels out of control. You know, that makes me think about something else that's hard to figure out. Justice. I mean, we hear it everywhere. Social justice, economic justice. But what did Aristotle even mean by justice? Good point. And it shows how these big philosophical ideas actually play out in our regular lives. Aristotle thought a just society was one where you get what you deserve. Okay, so you work hard, help out your community. You should be rewarded for that. Makes sense. But didn't he also have some pretty outdated ideas about things like slavery? He did. And it's really important to remember that. Aristotle, like a lot of people back then, thought that some people were just born to be slaves. He thought it was natural, which is obviously so wrong. Yeah, that's definitely not something to admire about Aristotle. It reminds us that even super smart people can have harmful and wrong beliefs. It also makes you think twice about everything you read, even the classics. Exactly. It's important to appreciate the good stuff from these great thinkers while also remembering that they had their blind spots. Like we're having this conversation with the past, taking in what's good, but also being honest about what's not. Yes. And like all good conversations, it should leave you with stuff to think about, new ideas to explore. You know, it's funny you mentioned conversations because um, one thing I thought was really interesting about Aristotle was what he thought about art and like stories. Mm -hmm. He seemed to get that art isn't just about having fun, it's about understanding ourselves and like the world, right? Yeah, that's true. And it's something where Aristotle and Plato really disagreed. Plato didn't really like art. Really? Yeah, he thought it distracted us from the truth. Like he was just a copy of a copy of reality. But Aristotle thought about it differently. He thought humans need to imitate things. It's how we learn and grow. So instead of thinking art wasn't as good as other things, Aristotle thought it was how we understand big truths about being human. Didn't he have some interesting ideas about tragedies specifically? He did. Aristotle thought that tragedies, even though they're really intense, do something really good for us. He called it catharsis. It's like when we watch those stories with all the drama and emotions, we get to feel all these big feelings like pity and fear, but like in a safe way. Mm -hmm. So like we're getting rid of those emotions. We can feel them completely. And then we come out feeling kind of refreshed. Yeah. Like after a good cry, you feel lighter. So Aristotle was basically all for letting your emotions out. Yeah, kind of. He knew that experiencing art, even when it's hard, can be really powerful. It's not about pretending the world isn't real, but facing it, learning from it, and maybe even finding some beauty in all the hard stuff about being human. Okay, so we've got Aristotle, the scientist, the philosopher, the ethicist, the art critic. This guy really did it all. But before we finish up this deep dive, I want to go back to something we talked about earlier. How can someone from so long ago still be relevant to our life, especially in a world that's like completely different now? Right. Especially after reading some of his work, it's easy to get caught up in what it was like back then. The things that just seem so wrong to us now. Like the whole slavery thing. Yeah. yeah it's definitely not okay now. Exactly. But what makes Aristotle someone we still care about is that he focused on these ideas that never change, like being a good person wanting to learn new things, believing that real happiness comes when you live a good life. Mm. 
Those are the things that people still care about no matter where or when they lived. They make us think about what it really means to be human. So we shouldn't take everything he said as like the absolute truth, but more like use his ideas to help us think about our own lives and how to live well. Exactly. And that's what I think is so great about learning from these philosophical giants. They make us think. They give us this way to ask those big questions about what it means to be alive, how we should act, and what it means to really flourish. And on that note, everyone, we're going to leave you with something to think about as you learn more about Aristotle. If he was alive today, seeing our crazy, busy, tech-obsessed world, what do you think he would say is the biggest thing stopping us from finding that eudaimonia? Only you can answer that. But something tells me he'd say we need to take a good, hard look at ourselves. Remember to find balance. And maybe even put those phones down every once in a while and really see what's going on around us. Until next time, keep on learning. And who knows, maybe that path to a good life really does start with some major point. Life in style is also life in balance. Make sure you pay attention to all the values and dimensions of your life. One is family. If you have someone you care about, there is no value to match that. One person caring for another is life in the best of style and value. Protect it with a vengeance. If a chair gets in the way, I suggest you destroy the chair. It was wisely said, so long ago, but is still true for today. There are many treasures, but the greatest of these is love. Better to live in a tent on the beach and have a love affair than to live in a mansion by yourself. Ask me, I know. Family must be cultivated like an enterprise, like a garden. Time and effort and imagination, creativity and genius must be summoned constantly to keep it flourishing and growing. Next is friendship. A priceless value, friendship. Friends are those incredible people who know all about you and still like you. Friends are those people who are coming in when everyone else is leaving. And as someone once suggested, be sure to make the kind of friends on your way up who will take you in on your way down. Life is a bit of both up and down. 
but with true friends, friends who care regardless of your circumstances. The ups are more automatic and the downs less devastating. I do have one very special friend though. If I was stuck in a Mexican jail and accused unduly, I would call this friend. Guess why I'd call this friend? He would come and get me. Now that is a friend. Someone who would come and get you. Guess how much you would spend to get me? Right, as much as it would take. It all begins and ends in your mind. What you give power to has power over you. Work on mastering your mind. At first, you choose a partner based on appearance and enjoy it until you realize that your children will be raised not based on appearance, but based on values. You cannot find peace by avoiding life. Virginia Woolf An intelligent person always hides three things about himself his weaknesses, his sources of wisdom, and his true aspirations. Most people stay in the same place for a reason. The things they hold dear are the anchors that hold them in place. When we transform ourselves, the world changes because the world is a projection of ourselves. Deepak Chopra disciplines is called how to capture the emotion and how to capture the wisdom and translate it into equity disciplines you start walking around the block it'll inspire you to get an apple get an apple it'll inspire you to get a book get a book it'll inspire you to get a journal get a journal it'll inspire you to grow develop some skills all disciplines affect each other every lack affects the rest every new affects the rest the key is to diminish the lack and set up the new and you've started a whole new life process. Also, one more thought on discipline. Here's the greatest value of discipline. Self-worth. Self-esteem. People are teaching self-esteem these days, but they don't connect it to disciplines. <coughs> the least lack of discipline. And it starts to erode our psyche. One of the greatest temptations is to just ease up a little bit. The, the, the slightest lack of doing your best starts to erode the psyche. Instead of doing your best, doing just a little less than your best. Sure enough. You say, well, it's just going to affect my sales. No, it's going to affect your consciousness. It's going to affect your philosophy. Now you've begun in the slightest way to affect your own philosophy. Here's the problem with the least neglect. Neglect starts as an infection. And if you don't take care of it, it becomes a disease. And one neglect leads to another. And the worst of all, when neglect starts, it diminishes our self-worth, our self-confidence, our self-value. You say, well, how can I get back my self-respect? I'm telling you, you don't have to go to 29 places. All you have to do is start the smallest discipline that now corresponds to your own philosophy, like I should, and I could, and I will. No longer. As several members in one body united, so are reasonable creatures in a body divided and dispersed, all made and prepared for one common operation. And this thou shalt apprehend the better, if thou shalt use thyself often to say to thyself, I am Melos, or a member of the mass and body of reasonable substances. But if thou shalt say, I am Meros, or a part, thou dost not yet love men from thy heart. The joy that thou takest in the exercise of bounty is not yet grounded upon a due ratiocination and right apprehension of the nature of things. Thou dost exercise it as yet upon this ground barely, as a thing convenient and fitting, not as doing good to thyself when thou dost good unto others. What the ancients called a clever fighter is one who not only wins, but excels in winning with ease. If nobody helps you, do it alone.
it is never too late to be what you might have been. George Eliot Just because your path is different from others doesn't mean you're lost. Excuses are always there and easy to make. Finding a way is what takes courage. The way the universe opens up when you are truly in love is the greatest gift, Rumi. Sun don't stop for nobody, man. Sun don't stop. Sun gonna be up in the morning regardless. That sun is gonna be up in the morning regardless. Regardless of how I feel and how depressed I am, the sun is gonna shine in the morning. And at nighttime, the moon gonna be there. And you gonna look up, these days gonna keep going by. So do you let the days go by and look up and you done wasted a year doing what? Or do you just pick it up? All right, well, gotta figure it out. Made some mistakes, life goes on. Let me figure out life from this point. You wanna become best, you wanna become champion. And now you wanna say like you're tired? Who cares? You're tired or not? Nobody cares about you. He was tired, he had personal problem, family Nobody cares. We're all writing a book. What's your book look like? Mm. What does your fucking book look like? Like your, your life is a book. You got a bunch of chapters in your book, but when they close that book, how good was the book? How good was your book? What was the ending to your book? Yeah. What was really your work ethic like and for how long did you stay disciplined? Um, well, I mean, I mean, every day, I mean, since, you know, 20 years, I mean, it was an everyday process and trying to figure out strengths and weaknesses. For example, jumping ability, man, my vertical was a 40, wasn't a 46 or 40, 45. Um, my hands are big, but they're not massive, right? So you got to figure out ways to strengthen them. So your hands are strong enough to be able to palm a ball and do the things that you need to do. Uh, quickness, I was quick, but not insanely quick. I was fast, but not ridiculously fast, right? So I had to rely on skill a lot more. I had to rely on angles a lot more. I had to study the game a lot more. And it just never changed. What I found is that winning doesn't happen on show day. It happens in the early mornings, painful workouts, long cardio sessions. To those who recommend persons to philosophers, Diogenes said well to one who asked from him letters of recommendation, that you are a man, he said, he will know as soon as he sees you, and he will know whether you are good or bad, if he is by experience skillful to distinguish the good and the bad. But if he is without experience, he will never know, if I write to him ten thousand times. For it is just the same as if a drachma asked to be recommended to a person to be tested. If he is skillful in testing silver, he will know what you are for you will recommend yourself. We ought then in life also to have some skill as in the case of silver.